Welcome. This seminar covers some, not all, ways you can create a comfortable setting for encounters with adults who have survived child sexual abuse, either by clergy or other adults who are trusted authority figures. We'll cover two areas. First, there are three basic kinds of boundaries you should know about, how to honor them and reinforce them. And second, there are many ways you can make early encounters with adult survivors safe and welcoming. This can help ground your future interactions as well. These ideas are for everyone, including those from other faiths, especially Christian faiths. But in particular, today, I'm speaking to priests and sisters. You are most commonly the ones to whom a survivor of abuse by clergy will reach out, often the first with whom they'll share the secret of their heart. For example, it's very common for a survivor to first reveal this in confession. It's as if we feel like we need to confess another sin. I know it's odd. But for confession, for many, confession retains a sense of safety. For others, confessing is like an act of hope, the sense that we could find relief. Now, your response to these encounters can have life-lasting impact, for good or for ill. I'm qualified to op offer this presentation based on personal experience, I'm, survive, I'm a survivor of clergy abuse from about age 7 to age 19. I've worked on recovery for over 30 years. This includes having gone to therapy and used other avenues like a 12-step program called Al-Anon and things like acupuncture and a kind of water therapy for pain. I've also chosen to remain Catholic. My goals are fairly simple. I wish to encourage all survivors of abuse and violence to integrate faith with their recovery programs. Helping you do so means that I've also helped them do so. I wish also to reconcile with the church with care, one Catholic at a time. That might just include you who are listening now. So thank you for helping me achieve my goals. You may remember from the Introduction to Basic Concepts this trajectory of hope. It's here just to remind you that recovery from abuse is a continuum. There are several ways we are victims. We are victims as children, first of all, and then we also may retain a sense of victimhood as we become adults, either emotionally or in fact. In fact, importantly, you may first meet us while we are in some kind of abusive relationship as an adult, something we are unable to escape because we are repeating patterns. I would like to point out that most importantly, if you meet us and we are in such an abusive relationship, the first order of business is to help us find a way out before we can begin to stabilize and create a new life. Importantly, being a, we are all survivors. We've already survived. But being a survivor over time entails more. It involves grappling with the effects now of what happened then. It requires sorting through past from present and making distinctions between what's healthy and what's not. It's a very long, messy process. For your work, you're likely to meet a survivor who's somewhere on the continuum in the re recovery mode, in the survival mode. And we move toward thriving. Most of us thrive, for most of us, thriving can be the greater part of our lives with a mindfulness toward the fact that the past does still creep up and to have tools to use so that it doesn't overtake our present again. For some of us, thriving is a release from the past entirely. Everybody's different on the trajectory of hope. Just remember, even someone lost in the mindset of being a victim, even somebody who is being victimized at home by an abusive relationship, may still be thriving somewhere in their lives, at work or in a private hobby like 
painting. You never know. So let's look at the three types of boundaries and then first encounters. Together, these can help you cultivate a spiritually healing dialogue with any victim of abuse, including those abused sexually as children by clergy. The first physical boundary, a way to understand it, you might call it the bubble of space. That's how it's referred to in some recovery literature. Remember, this person's physical boundaries were crushed before ever being formed. Consider, at the defining moment of our childhood or youth, the most innocent pat or hug turned into something very dark and traumatic. So physicality remains confusing. So you want to be physically non-threatening. Don't get really close. Use a gentle voice. Avoid um, aggressive or intrusive gestures. Certainly your handshake can be firm, but don't be gripping and don't hold on a long time. These are minor things that we will notice. And second, don't do sexually confusing things. No great big hugs, okay? Now you'd think these are just normal professional boundaries, but in a setting where somebody drops their guard and talks openly about something as personal as abuse, it's also very common for people to drop their guard in response. And it's very common in my experience to say, gee, I want to give you a great big hug. Well, don't. Keep the professional boundaries and then you keep a sense of safety and clarity for us. Another thing about the physical setting or the physical world and its boundaries are triggers. Triggers can be visual. We can hear them, touch them, taste them. Particularly, smells often trigger people. Triggers bring up the past, and sometimes they bring up the memory. When you're walking down the street, you might smell the, the smell of something that someone you love cooked, your mother cooked. And it brings back the thought, the warm memory of a dinner around a table with people you care about. For people who have been abused by clergy, for example, they can walk by a church. A whiff of incense can just touch their nostril. Their memory, visually, intellectually, may not go back to the past but they can walk down the street feeling all of the emotional and physical pain of being abused. That happened to me. That was why it was so hard for me to go into churches for years sometimes, and why sometimes when I attended Mass, it was from a parking lot with the missile in my hand, because I just couldn't bear to get into the church because of all the triggers there and how it would leave me emotionally for not just a day, but a week. It's like a game of shooting ladders where you kind of climb up and you avoid all of the perils and you get almost to the top, to the finish line, and you hit a chute and you go wham down to the very bottom to start again. That's what a trigger can do. It can take you from the present instantaneously to the past without you ever complying or choosing. And your, for your case, for your situation, you need to understand every individual has different triggers and need to be willing to help identify and remove them from the setting where you meet or possibly move to a different room, but to take them seriously. Now, the second kind of boundary to be mindful about um, is the emotional boundary. There's all sorts of emotions, as I will talk about. And they're very difficult, and we will show up full of them and confused at times. As Father Lou, with whom I give retreats and um, some speeches sometimes, often says, St. Francis de Sales sa says, spiritual direction starts where the person is. Or St. Augustine says, grace will build on nature. Well, the nature of what we are when we walk and start talking to you can be very much full of tumult and turmoil, and that's where we start. The boundary is understanding that this is the starting point. Don't judge. Don't judge where we are. 
don't get defensive about our feelings, even if our feelings start to overflow and rattle you. Accept that we are there with the emotions. You don't necessarily have to accept the emotions, but that our state is highly emotional and respect us. Don't go intellectual. There is the great background of scholasticism in the Catholic Church that can fuse intellect and heart. This isn't the place for that. Keep it very simple and affirm to us that as we show up, God loves us. That's a radical experience for somebody who's been abused. And also don't own what we're going through. This is my cross to carry. I tell people that all the time. I don't like it. I've resented it at times, but it's still mine, and you really can't share it. And if you try, you're going to burn out. What I did need and do need from people is a sense of hope that God will help me carry this cross. Let's say you're dealing with somebody uh, um, who has a diagnosed mental illness. Well, first of all, as I say, remember, we're not our illnesses. This is a full person with a credible experience of his or her world. It re-wounds, it re-wounds all survivors not to be believed. And that goes for somebody whose diagnosis you might misunderstand as a sign that their story of trauma can't be trusted. If you can't accept their story of suffering, how can you witness their journey toward new life in resurrection? So take time to understand mental illness. Don't avoid questions about the diagnosis. As time permits, ask what the illness feels like, how it affects their life, how they manage it, and how you might help. Don't condescend or patronize to this person, even if they seem more wounded than others. What they need more than anything is to feel the equality with the next guy who might show up in pain but not have a mental illness because we're all equally loved by God, we're all equal in front of God, and anyone struggling with the mental illness diagnosis, especially early on, needs to understand that they, the person, are a full child of God. So don't fear this, respect it, and the person will learn with you not to fear but to respect themselves. You'll remember Tools for Recovery um, I covered in a prior seminar, but the boundaries here are about you versus all of these activities. You're not the therapist. You're not the people who will be part of this activity. For example, in 12-step programs, there are sponsors. You're not the sponsor for the drug abuse. What's important is you understand you can't be all things to this survivor. Now, you might do your work so well that you might feel be the first person who's safe for this survivor to talk to. I understand it's a wonderful feeling. And you know what? It's got a wonderful upside and a little downside. What you have to be careful about is that they don't stop and expect all things from you. But understand it's our job as survivors to sew the quilt that will cover us and help us and that no one person can be that for us. Last and th- the, you know, the third boundary to bear in mind are psychic boundaries. It, they're harder to describe, but it is ha- does have to do with your ability to listen and not get into the person's problem. It is about you not judging, but letting the person be exactly who they are in this moment and being able to affirm them for what they are without having to affirm all of the all of the feelings and even the impulses, for example, toward suicide or drug abuse. Add to these your own need for self-awareness and your own need to be very clear about what are fair expectations of this person. In terms of self-awareness, the idea that you get to be who as you are, opposed to 
and to kind of ignore all the signals that you're giving, it doesn't work. Your body language and everything you say and do will be read carefully by survivors who are trying to avoid ever being abused again. So we try to read all the signals. We have a hypervigilance. You need to understand a big distinction between your need and, and a survivor's need. For example, if you feel yourself an impulse rising to fix it, to make it better, to find just the right word to release this person from their agony, that's your need. The survivor's need is to trust a process, to endure and walk through it, and to find God and grace to help them. It's also important that you understand differences in your role versus others' roles, and I've mentioned that before. A sponsor in a 12-step program, a therapist in therapy is going to have a very different role from you as a spiritual friend, companion, guide, counselor. So don't try to wing this. You need knowledge about this. You need to know how to be sensitive about this or you'll end up re-wounding this person. However, what you do learn, you will be able to use for people who've been abused in all circumstances, not just as children, but also as adults. And what's really important is to understand what you're saying to this person, even if they're very mad at you, could in fact be helping heal a whole system of people, as you recall, the wounds and the vicarious wounding goes out to many circles of people. And what is a fair expectation of this survivor? Well, as usual with God, expect miracles, but don't expect miracles on your terms. This person may make peace and move on to something that's safe and doesn't constantly trigger them. Or they may be like me and many others I know who resume a relationship with Catholicism. But understand something. I still have to work through triggers, sometimes many Sundays in a row. Uh, daily Mass isn't quite as hard. And I sometimes do stop and think, gee, man, this is really hard. Now, Eucharist keeps bringing me back, but I understand why some people just are about making peace. Ultimately, this really has to do with your vocations, your ministry, your own faith, because essentially you're all about helping people's relationship with God flourish. Let God do all the other work. Let the spirit flourish between you and this person. And that brings us to the early encounters. Now that we've gotten through the three boundaries, let's look here. Now remember, the person you meet, the survivor who approaches you the first time, is under extreme strain. This one step to speak to you marks a huge step out of everything that has isolated him or her until now. All of the taboos, all the things that have kept us silent, have, have been very powerful. So to take the step now is very brave. And for many, not all, a high price is being paid. And not in my experience, but in many people's experience, they're ostracized by their own family for breaking the secret. They're disowned as liars. Or the families are disassembling as some family members side with the survivor believing them and other family members side with the abuser continuing to enable them. So it takes a lot of courage just to come up to you. And the whole thing is if they get out of that conversation unscathed and unharmed, you're doing great. That in itself will be a huge relief and the exact opposite of what they experienced with the abuser. Before these early encounters, let's talk about your mindset and get that right. So the most important thing you don't want to do is lecture. Don't pretend you've got much to say in the face of this suffering. Like everyone, be willing to be silent before suffering and let the person in you who is a pastor care. Offer care and compassion. Whatever you do, 
don't try to solve this. This pain is not a problem. It can't be solved. We're going to know you're uncomfortable with our suffering if you use some standard, way overused phrase like, get over it, move on, forgive and forget. You might as well admit you just can't endure the pain we're forced to endure for a lifetime. That makes you not credible. What you want to do is honor the fact that we are in pain, honor the fact that we survived this, this, the victimhood. Don't overwhelm us, especially be careful of this in early encounters. Keep it simple. Mostly what we'll remember is a sense of safety. That's what will bring us back. Being overwhelmed by your talking or your personal charisma will not feel safe. So keep it simple. Similarly, don't dominate the dialogue. Don't have a formula in your mind how this first encounter should go or how your connection to this person should unfold. Follow where the survivor's words lead, where their needs are, and invite the spirit in to lead you both to guide this person in meeting you and in this person's recovery. Don't be linear. Don't expect someone to start at A and get to Z in an orderly fashion. Expect circles. Expect doubling back. Don't look and ask questions to get logic out of a person when they're sitting in, the, in a huge tsunami of feelings. Just listen and let us contradict ourselves because in a way, you're a sounding board. But do repeat what few things you say. Keeping things simple, you'll say, but a few things. And we, being overwhelmed, will forget them all. So be willing to repeat them. Beware of pity. It holds a person at arm's length, and we'll feel that. Pity holds a person down by underestimating how far we've come already. By contrast, offering radical respect to the fact that we're a survivor standing in front of you will even shock us a little bit. And consider the difference between appearance and heartfelt care. We're going to be very nervous around something that feels disingenuous. Not so much about you, but we're always a little worried that you could be yet another abuser with a hidden agenda. Now, I've never met personally a priest, deacon, sister in the seminars or retreats I've given who were not deeply heartfelt in their desire to offer support. But understand, we're nervous, we're jittery, and we don't know your heart. So, like me, we're going to be a little worried if it's just window dressing that you're there. And bear in mind what we've seen, whether firsthand or just in the media, that the church at times has treated us and the existence of survivors like a PR problem when the church really had a truth problem. Here, an amends works out powerfully in your ability to bring the truth, capital T, to us. And based on my experience, if I had a bet, my money's on the ministers in the Catholic Church being able to authentically help people who've been abused. But remember, authenticity is crucial. Your training in matters of faith and ministry is critical. More critical is your vocation and how it has unfurled in your life, in your very identity. That's what you bring to bear. And that's also what you mix with the knowledge, a very accurate knowledge about abuse, about mental illness, about their impact, and about the needs of a person who shows up in front of you. And as long as you understand these basics, you'll understand this is not about a goal-oriented process. It's really about a God-oriented life. And in that sense, it's very much like all people in the world who are seeking to live God-oriented lives. Keeping this in mind, your mindset can be trained on a survivor and his or her burden of suffering and shame 
and you can become a mirror reflecting beauty as God sees us, not as the abuser taught us we were. As your mindset clarifies, you can turn attention to the setting, and now we will too. Physically, you want to make sure there are no interruptions and no distractions, no clutter, no wristwatch alarms, no blackberries going off, no phone, no rush. This has to be a private setting for a person to, who, who is full of shame and agony to speak. They, we need to feel listened to and not rushed. We don't want to, to trust you then to feel like we're an inconvenience that's ushered out the door. Understand it's very smart if you have an appointment with one of us, not to have something the period after, but to listen to us for that time and permit us to go over if suddenly we find ourselves weeping or telling you more than we expected and give yourself time to regroup after we leave. You want the survivor to feel, in a sense, safe with you, whether they're alone or not. But also, often it's a very good idea to invite them to bring a support person. That might be from their family, spouse maybe, maybe a 12-step sponsor or a therapist, but just somebody who can come along and help us remember, because we forget everything, and kind of think it through. Um, in our diocese, the victim assistance coordinator attends, kind of like a shepherd for the survivor through the whole process, a constant, and again, another kind of sounding board. So if you plan to have somebody attend with you, tell the person ahead. For that matter, plan ahead. Give them advance notice. Give great directions because we'll get lost because we're nervous. Give them a secretary or an assistant's name to call in case we get lost or stopped by, let's say, the security guard in the front. And now consider the office itself, decluttered, quiet, but also remember, we're people who have felt trapped in our lives. Make sure we have access to an exit, that we can see it, maybe we sit by it, the one thing that should never happen, you should never sit between the exit and us. Consider the temps, the temperatures in your office. Keep them cold. Why? Survivors classically show up wearing a lot of clothes. I remember my first meeting with Father Mark, who turned into my spiritual guide for 10 years. Um, and the first conversation we had, I, it was warm outside, but I wore several coats a turtleneck, um, collar up to my ears, hands in my pocket. It was odd because I'm an older professional. I'm not used to behaving that way, but it was the only way I felt safe. And, you know, he never even batted an eye, and we kept talking. Here's also a place with for gestures of choice. Um, you know, what chair does the person want? Would they like water or tea or soda? Um, is, is the heat comfortable or is the sun in their eyes? This helps you pace things slowly. It also helps you show them that care comes first and then they'll have your attention second. That creates a memorable experience that even though we forget everything you say, we won't forget. Meanwhile, let's review responses that really won't help that you should not do, and instead things you can do to help. First, you listen. They're sitting in your office, they're, you're sitting over coffee, wherever you may be. You've created a setting and a state of mind conducive to listening without judgment. So now do. Just listen. Listen and listen. Smile a little. Be relaxed. Don't start questioning and pressing for details. Just receive what they offer, like they offer, and no more. If an abuser is, um, if the abuser they tell you about is within the Catholic Church, for example, clergy, employee, or a volunteer, there are prescribed ways for reporting that you can get to. But immediately, most immediately, as you sit there, 
don't get defensive. Don't try to say, well, the church isn't bad like this one abuser. Just listen. Let this person say what they've probably never been able to say before. Also, acknowledge this trauma and the suffering. Don't minimize it. You can remind them they made it. You can remind them that they're not only a survivor, a victim, but also a survivor. This is a good starting place. It highlights the accomplishment that we survivors minimize ourselves. We don't need your help doing it. Help us remember it's a big deal. We're just sitting there in one piece. And as you do so, recognize the burden. Remember, this is their burden, not yours. The word, the operative word is their and not yours. Social workers, psychologists, frankly, long-term veterans of 12-step programs also are practiced in not owning someone else's burden. It protects the survivor from you when you don't confuse their pain with your own. The fact, the very hard fact, is that we survivors must bear this burden. We didn't deserve it, but it's ours. We have to grapple with it. We have to make peace with it. We somehow have to transcend it in our own way, in our own time. And that is what this is just beginning in our conversation with you. So like I've mentioned, permit the strong feelings to be there and understand they will not always be there. That the less we resist, the more we accept them, the more they'll subside. And like I've mentioned, Catholicism has a rich history of scholasticism with knowledge fused with grace and heart. However, now isn't the time to go there. Simply let the feelings be in the room without judgment. Believe in your heart that they are not permanent. Believe in your heart the feelings are not the person. We will depend on that. And don't personalize the feelings, even if they're directed to you. For now, for the beginning, the survivor has got to face these feelings. They are a common starting point, but they are not the end point. And you knowing that helps us. Saying something about healing is a process is very helpful for you both. It lets the survivor know you understand his or her dilemma. We, um, I wanted a kill switch. We all want it over immediately. Hearing from you recovery is a process is hard but credible. And it also puts you in unison with all the other recovery wisdom. It lets you also begin talks about the faith journey. So don't try to fix this because you can't any more than the survivor can. Wait together for God to work his wonder on his time. And now the survivor has finished their story. You may or may not have made some of these comments already. But now it's your turn. And your initial replies at this point are very important and have great power. There are about five statements that helped me and I hear from other survivors are extremely helpful. I'm going to share them with you now. If all you say are these five things over and over, you will have an enormous healing impact on this person. And the first one is just to let yourself have the human and true response that you're likely feeling. To say the most elemental truth, I am sorry this happened to you, person to person. If the abuse occurred in the church, whether it's not and without taking personal responsibility yourself, to apologize and acknowledge that we failed you is critical. Also, it wasn't your fault. This is something that we never know for sure until we've really moved into recovering. I would say it's critical 
we can't get to a thriving state until we understand it wasn't our fault. Therapists will say it to us. Others will say it to us. And we will believe it on or off. It may be, we may almost completely believe it. But if the abuse occurred in the church, the fact that you are in the church means that you will have great power when you say this to the person. Similarly, a very important statement is, you are not what happened to you. This also gets said quite a lot in recovery programs. And it's part of the work of recovery. What is us? What is not us? Just because I experienced degrading um, activity, degrading harm and trauma, does not mean I am degraded, and so on. And most importantly, to reassure us we are loved by God. Everyone struggles with this, but if you're a survivor of abuse full of shame and hiding for years, you particularly feel untouched, even like you're hiding from God. And how important are these statements? I'll tell you how in my life, I sometimes, I didn't believe them when I met the bishop and Father Mark, and frankly, um, sometimes in my weaker days, I don't believe them now. As the past kind of creeps up on me some days, I just play these statements in the voice of the bishop who said them to me many, many times, or of Father Mark who said them to me many more times. They're like organic podcasts in my brain, and I rely on their faith. Or as they say in some 12-step programs, I borrow their faith when mine is weak. So what's the takeaway? Well, the first one, possibly the only one, yet the most important one, is we get in and we got out and we're safe. No harm happened. That is shocking in an antidote, as an antidote, as the opposite to what occurred to us. Now, you might not see us for a week, a month, a year, but I guarantee any survivor who has an encounter like this with you We'll be mulling it over, taking it deeper and deeper through all the defensives. Might take a long time, but taking it in. So be patient. And maybe some of the affirming things you've said, maybe the way with which you have projected and, re and, and reflected our dignity to us will stick with us. Maybe all of those gentle points of choice that you've offered to us will make us feel a sense of flexibility in your presence. Those are wonderful things to which we will return. But don't underestimate the fact that you've given us relief. To actually share something that has weighed on our hearts in isolation with somebody whom we actually think is pretty okay is a life-changing experience. Don't expect a lot of yourself. We've lived on crumbs, and one will do a trick some days. And now the longer-term relationship may begin, as I say, in fits and starts. As I mentioned, maybe not very often, but it will be there. It won't necessarily be regular, and it will be in parallel to other recovery activities and tools. But now it's important to just come into your own in your own role, not as therapist but as a spiritual guide, not as a parent. And for people who have had no childhood, we often turn to all the wrong people to be parents when we're adults. But you are a stepping stone to our real father. You're not the abuser. You're here now. But we could mix you up with the abuser just in an emotionally difficult time. That's where a good, healthy relationship between you and the survivor can sustain a question like this. Maybe you want to bring this strong feeling to talk to your therapist. You're not a catalyst. You're not the interventionist. You're a witness. You're not about giving advice. You're about affirming someone as through prayer they discern God's will. You're not a solver of problems, and you never will be. God's love is enough for this person. And from time to time, you may feel, like many people feel, the temptation to step in and save us from ourselves when we're doing stupid stuff. 
But that's all part of our process. And there is only one Savior. And for us, like all people, it remains a choice whether we will turn to him and whether we want our identity grounded in God. So what is this kind of connection with re of recovery with the spirituality of our faith? Well, for one thing, ministry itself becomes an act of listening. And for another, your intent to support us becomes credible. It's not superficial. It's not self-aggrandizing. For another, we begin to find safe access to others, you, and as we interact with you and learn from you and feel and see you model good boundaries, we start learning and testing ourselves and using these lessons with others. Also, what happens is the healing process, we hear from you. Well, we start working with you on that process as a faith journey. And that's really where marvelous things can begin. And last, we start reaffirming the primary relationship with God. In this case, our relationship with you also has God in it. It's like the Trinity. And suddenly we can start seeing that God is in all of our relationships. And suddenly we realize that even the ruptured ones have God and his grace there with us so that we aren't alone when we have to go face them, no matter how difficult they may be. So these are some watershed moments we must take on our trajectory of hope with you as we walk through our faith journey. We really must choose survival over victimhood. Until we do, we really can't make really great progress. Now, sometimes that is a works out as choosing life over death in drugs or over suicide. Sometimes it, cho it means we're choosing just taking care of ourselves over the kind of childish abandon survivors sometimes have. Also, we must accept the burden of this past that is ours. We must face it and not avoid it at some point so we can integrate it and move beyond it. That's a mouthful. But from a spiritual point of view, it's how do we accept suffering in our life without being taken down by that. And that's where all of the spiritual truth, the realities of Christianity and Catholicism start to flourish in our faith journey. For example, often in recovery programs, we're told to have affirmations to help us develop self-esteem, which was destroyed in the process of abuse. And I kept thinking, well, I have no respect for myself, so why am I going to believe myself when I tell myself to have self-esteem? And it was quite a conundrum till I really came to peace with the fact that I was a child of God who esteemed me. And even now, I'm not sure I have esteem, but I certainly know I have a lot of respect for myself because God does. And that's how it works out in my life. Similarly, coming to understand my own and others' boundaries has a great deal to do with how people in recovery work with me, and that would include you, but also learning from God that I can stop. There can be an end to me, and he will take up from there. And last, what happens with our primary relationship with God growing stronger, our relationships become deeper and more stable. And this too is something that recovery work, therapy, 12-step programs, other types of um, healing arts all point to as a sign that our lives are getting healed and we are moving toward a state of thriving. But for our purposes, this comes a great deal from integrating faith into recovery, particularly Thriving is especially possible when our lives are flooded, not just with grace, but opened with, by our willingness to receive it. And now just a few miscellaneous but helpful thoughts for you um, have to do with 
when you have events with for people who are survivors, very, or when you have an appointment with a survivor and they don't show up, remember, I didn't show up for some of my appointments, or at least I, it looks like I skipped them. Um, I promised to be at certain events and no one saw me, but I drove by. Now, I wasn't a stalker, but I was really that nervous, and I was really checking out whether these people were kind of freaky looking or whether it looked like a safe setting. And then I sat in a car and I kind of peeked and watched, and I skipped the appointment and I called back, and people were really understanding that survivors do that all the time. It takes a while to get even to the place where you can have the conversation. So be patient. Survivor-driven um, events are very helpful. Asking survivors or a survivor what would make them comfortable, including even where offering two or three different optional meeting places. Perhaps it's hard to meet in a church. Perhaps it's easier to meet at a coffee shop. I don't know. But think of some places you'd be willing to talk that would be fairly peaceful, fairly without interruption, where a person might be able to be teary. And then offer several options to the person. But when survivors get together, remember to keep clear ground rules. There should certainly be clear ground rules, not, not punitive ones, not authoritarian ones, but ones you work out with the survivor for your meetings, um, both maybe the setting, what makes people comfortable, but also what makes you comfortable. And then also if survivors meet each other, bear in mind, it's very easy for survivors, especially early in their recovery, to divulge far too many details of the exact abuse to far too many people. It's just kind of part of the process to learn that you don't have to tell everybody everything. And in that, you may want to have ground rules that if survivors are together, they don't share details of their abuse because to hear details of one person's abuse can trigger all the other survivors in a room. So bear in mind, ground rules up front are very good. And of course, this all points to the need for leaders and, and ministers such as yourself being sensitized. One our diocese, um, of course, the diocese where I, I have been helped and also do a great deal of volunteer work is Arlington, Virginia. It has a particularly diverse and mature program um, offering all of these different activities to survivors plus some. And by unseen deeds of kindness, I'm telling stories on them in terms of, you know, sometimes the victim assistance coordinators sit in a church with a survivor and just let them cry for the first time ever being back in a church for decades. Um, there are lots of little tiny quiet things they do for people one-on-one -on -one that Nobody knows about, unless you happen to be a survivor. Um, and bear in mind that they do, they've, they've developed this over 10 years, and you might find them and their website, arlingtondiocese.org, very, very helpful. They have a three-ring binder ready for you. They're ready to give any diocese or any group, um, Catholic group, the, the help setting up kind of survivor outreach. But I recommend, rather than getting a hernia trying to carry this three-ring binder around, you ask them for the CD. The USCCB has similarly has some pretty great stuff. What I would say is you can use my personally favorite website, my own, teresagreen.org, and I'll, my website will link you with annotations to both of these other websites and what you can find there and help you kind of navigate around. Um, I'd also recommend, if you're feeling low and in touch with your errors more than your successes in this process, why don't you read my book, Restoring Sanctuary, it's a chronicle of um, all of the encounters along my recovery, or at least the top ones that helped me get back into my Christian faith and ultimately to reconcile with Catholicism. Most of the people featured, all of them are wonderful, but most of them feature unwittingly help me. Uh, so that might be heartening to you. I also would like to say that uh, with Father Lou, who I mentioned earlier, um, I've written a book called Veronica's Cloth. We wrote it to help people be spiritual companions for survivors of child sexual abuse. We cover about 400 topics that are typical in recovery from feelings to fears to, um, 
to even all sorts of uh, tools that you find in recovery. And I talk a little bit about it for about 200 words or so. And Father Lou comes in and talks about it for about 200, 300 words from a Salesian point of view, ways a spiritual director might respond to this. It was a very powerful process. Father Lou is wonderful. He speaks on this too. I hope you hear him talk about this sometime. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I want to again thank Our Lady of Lourdes who helped me through darkness that I'm still shocked I came through. I'd like to thank you for your gift of self and for your ministry to survivors and to everyone. Keep the faith and God bless us, everyone. <laughs>